Okay, um, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker to you, Katerina. Um, she is an assistant professor in the machine learning department at CMU. She did her PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. And after that, she was a fellow at UC Berkeley and at Google Research. Her recent work on learning from unlabeled data or videos and 3D data using, for example, contrastive objectives is at the moment paving the road uh, towards learning to detect or associate uh, in an unsupervised manner. Another open question that we have introduced in the beginning is what is the right representation of doing these tasks that we're talking about today? And can we go from images or videos directly to a 3D representation? And is this even beneficial for um, the goals we have? And Katerina, we are very excited to have you here today and looking forward to learning more from your experience in these topics. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, thank you for asking these questions in the intro. This is exactly what we're going to discuss uh, in the talk. Um, okay, so yeah, let's uh, jump uh, directly. I mean, given how many excellent talks the workshop has had already, uh, I don't need to introduce the problem of tracking is very, very basic. Uh, and one thing we did uh, recently in the lab is we, talk, uh, uh, we took uh, very successful, very recent architectures. I mean, it depends now. It's been like six months now, probably is old already. Uh, for um, doing 2D object tracking. And one thing we had in mind is this rare object problem. So we said, instead of training an object detector and tracker for a particular category, what if we just throw together all categories and try to learn the generic objectness notion, which by the way, recent uh, state of the art uh, detectors of uh, Philip is here. So from Philip's, uh, Philip's paper, recent Philip's paper, just say, you know, just predict generic objectness and the labeling comes later exactly so that different objects can share features with one another. So to, to motivate uh, generative representations for visual tracking, we will first discuss feed forward, uh, you know, networks for visual tracking. So here is a, a paper that I really liked, a tra trans center transformers with dense queries for multi object tracking, where at every location, we predict uh, the center and uh, its association with previous frame, much like center point, but with different backbone and deformable attention backbone. And here we'll just merge it with, uh, so that we don't have just bound boxes as output, but rather uh, object uh, segmentations. We'll merge it with this other world box to pix by assigning pixels to objects. And the architecture will look something like that. Uh, there is not much temporal context, is uh, pairs of frames. So the associations are decided uh, based on pairs of frames, but you know, uh, transformers have given us now the ideas of using these slots to also look anywhere we like uh, in the temporal video. Uh, but here's just going to be pairs of frames will decide the associations. Uh, so we train that just using MS Coco data. Again, a trick of recent works. You don't need labeled videos to train detectors. You can just take an image and move around the objects, the object bonding boxes and simulate, make fake motion. And then we fired this to see how well it was working. And all the bounding boxes are labeled as person because there's just one category. The category is generic, essentially. And you'll see that uh, it can detect objects uh, pretty accurately and follow them. And the color is going to indicate the identity. Uh, and it achieves a decent min AP in Kitty while it has never been trained on Kitty. Um, and, and the question is, and of course, if you run the same, uh, how to say, architectures or similar architectures, not from 2D images, but rather in uh, 3D point clouds, or if you infer, essentially, the camera stabilization, you'll do much better because you make the job of the association much easier. Of course, if it's URI 3D instead of 2D, like uh, 3D center point. Um, but, but the question is, uh, and, and because the title of the workshop is multi-object tracking, is not multi-object tracking for driving, Okay, and then driving is a particular scenario where the objects don't actually interact too much with one another, you know, just have independent cars moving rigidly and so on. Um, so there are many other cases where objects interact way more closely. So here you're making a salad and as you add things more and more, um, you know, the, you hide the previous objects completely with new ones. There's very strong physics, uh, uh, constraints penetrating the interaction across the objects, which you don't have in self-driving scenes where you just have independent cars. Uh, of course, you have other constraints. Cars move in a particular way, right? They don't fly. They also don't move sideways like crabs. 
so constraints are in all domains, but you know, beyond cars that are independent objects, if you look at these generic things that we do in our everyday cooking life and so on, you do need different representations. And I think we will all realize that because now Echo 4D is coming with 3000 hours of uh, weekly labeled videos where we'll see objects not in isolation, but in extremely entanglement and cross interaction. Okay. Um, and the question is, and, and just to, to say here, these uh, labels that you saw is uh, just, again, there's no human labeling. We just took boxes and took their features and fit them to clip uh, model. And we had a set of generic labels that they say the human will say during making that salad and clip manages to find the correct uh, matching. And the, the good thing with clip is that you don't need to have nouns as labels, but you can have, let's say, the ball of pepper or the tall ball of pepper. It can be just noun phrases. OK, so now the question is, I mean, having also seen the right previous talk, yes, self-driving companies are doing extremely well uh, by you know labeling the bounding boxes, plus uh, the excellent uh, and fantastic, it, it actually works surprisingly in practice, this self-training. You detect confident detections, and then you use them as pseudo training training data to retrain and update your detector, OK? Uh, and this indeed gives you boosts. But uh, is this some um, all? Like, does the story end there? Um, so we will advocate for more generative uh, methods. Well, I mean, what if we have this nice and fast feedforward forward process that will indeed work very well in domain on things that we've seen before? And you know, you can also shift train, I agree. And in this way, you can propagate potentially the labels, et cetera. But I feel that this will, will soon hit um, a wall in that direction if we don't try to just explain how the objects are interacting and what the object looks as a whole behind the occlusion, and et cetera, et cetera. And to do that, yeah, the 3D space is one, uh, but other important properties should be there, like the modularity of the way you're going to build the 3D representation and so on. Um, so, so one thing that today we'll talk, uh, unfortunately, we'll, we won't be able to solve all these problems, but you know, it, I mean, we have a lot of um, work in the lab that is actually trying to target exactly these, uh, these problems. But one persistent problem is a model completion. So a model completion is just that the car, when we see a car, is not just what we see, is there is behind part, the dark side of the object that we humans very, very easily can in paint, can, using our imagination, using our memory, but our networks, if they're trained fit forward, uh, potentially just by mapping pixels to labels, potentially they can bypass this process. They don't need to explicitly learn how to complete it. All right. So we'll just propose training schemes now to you know, force our networks to when they see an object to really imagine the alternative uh, viewpoints. So we'll take 2D images and try to map them to complete 3D feature uh, maps. So instead of looking at the 2D pixel image, we'll learn a mapping from that 2D pixel image to a 3D feature map. Essentially, it's just a grid, uh, a 3D feature grid with width, height, and depth, where every grid point holds a feature vector. And that feature vector essentially describes appearance and geometry and physical properties of the scene at a particular location. Uh, so we have, um, like, for the last uh, Two years we've been working on these architectures. We call them geometry aware uh, networks that take sequence of images, estimate ego motion, 3D rotation, and translation between them, and lift them, map them each image to a 3D feature map, and aggregate those 3D feature maps. Um, and the important uh, two features of those networks is that first, the latent state is three dimensional, uh, three spatial dimensions, I mean, instead of 2D. and the way you update the features is you really go through ego motion estimation. And uh, yes, dr driving companies also do that, right? They, they have an excellent uh, ego motion estimation. So when you really don't want to, to just, you know, be the benchmark, but want to use the representation for a downstream task of driving or of cooking or imitating, you really, you know, cannot stay in the 2D space, but to go in 3D and all these things become very important, like ego motion uh, stabilization and so on and so forth. So how these networks work, uh, here is a frame. I am projected, I shoot rays of pixels in 3D, or if I have a depth channel, I use the depth channel to shoot those rays in a more informative way. And then I have 3D convolutions or uh, 3D convolutions to densify that volume. Um, and then I, you know, each time a new frame comes, I estimate ego motion 
and first fix the 3D feature map by rotating and translating and everything is, and, and is differentiable because you use 3D dense transformer networks to do that. And then you dump and you know, add the feature maps and here's another frame and so on. So this is very much to what the SLAM does. Uh, and the only difference with SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping the, that also estimates ego motion and also is, uh, com tries to compute the depth map. Here, instead of trying to compute the depth per image, we try to compute the complete 3D uh, feature content. So not the 2.5D, which is just what you see, but also with the current depth, but rather the complete feature content. What is, what is that you don't see in the current frame? You're supposed, if you ask the network to add it, at least here, at least you give a placeholder. You add some place for the network to, 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 to put it here. And how do you encourage the network to add it there? Well, because you train it, um, you train it to predict a viewpoint like here. So a query image comes and then you ask the network, how would that image look from that particular viewpoint? And the network will place its mental camera to the right location and render the 3D feature map and you know, get an image and then compare, okay? Uh, and uh, going um, through that, uh, through that explicit 3D, three-dimensional bottleneck uh, gives um, benefits in practice regarding generalization, as opposed to staying in 2D or 1D or squeezing the whole scene into 1D or 2D vectors or two-dimensional uh, feature maps, 1D vectors or 2D feature maps. And you can train the network on two scenes without even depth as input, just from images. And then you can test it on four objects and you'll see that you actually can generalize. So the network can see four objects as opposed to two objects. And here you have a network that was also trained with your prediction. In fact, there are tons of networks trained with your prediction, but doesn't go through an explicit three-dimensional bottleneck. And as you see, it uh, still imagines two objects. So it is not able to do the reasonable generalization we would expect uh, that humans do, right? So humans can also very easily generalize uh, from few objects to many objects. Now, a few extensions we did to this uh, architecture. One here is uh, uh, by Adam Harley, um, uh, my PhD student that instead of rendering images, you render feature maps and you use a contrastive uh, matching between your prediction and the actual features that are computed from the image. And both this feed forward essentially futurization of the target view and this top-down pathway, your predictive pathway are both trained jointly. So there's no, you don't need to take ready features and like a frozen VGG or something else. So they're trained jointly through a standard pixel-wise contrastive uh, matching. Uh, so this uh, contrastive matching can happen in the 2D space or in the 3D space. You can lift the query view in a 3D feature map and try to do uh, grid-wise, voxel-wise, essentially, uh, feature matching. And I think we are all very, very familiar with the baseline of 3D point contrast that takes two RGBD views and tries to say the same point that you can see from both viewpoints should be placed close and different points should be placed far. And the difference here is that when you have two views, the predicted and the query, this matching doesn't happen only from points that are jointly visible, but also from invisible points that are uh, invisible either from both views or that are invisible only from one or the other, because each view is lifted to a complete 3D feature map. Uh, so there is an impainting and then there is a matching. So that's the main uh, difference. Uh, so you have the positive correspondences and the negative correspondences based on whether two pixels are in the same location or in different locations uh, in the image. Um, and, and as you see now, you have this 3D feature map and you can visualize it because you can slice it and put your camera wherever you feel like. And here we put the camera from the bird view and um, you can you know, take the feature vectors, the long feature vectors and map them to three values and map them to colors and, co and show them. And you see that the features essentially capture lanes and on the road and cars and so on and so forth that you may not be even be able to, to label yourself, right? So the idea now is that with those learned features, you should be able to supply few labels and then somehow those labels will propagate. So the idea is that the more things you do are uh, unsupervised and there are many unsupervised tasks and that's one that goes through imagination and completion now, the less labels you'll need uh, for your task to, to complete your task and so on. 
uh, of course, uh, self-training also has the same uh, goal of how do I do well with as little labels as possible. And it's not generative, it's just all the way discriminative, right? So yeah, another thing you can do, of course, with those features is that you can track objects without having uh, been training to track those objects just by matching the features and so on. Another thing you can do is, after you've done this view prediction, is you can train detectors on top of those 3D feature map. And you'll see that your 3D detector uh, requires less labels. So here is the mean AP, is the success of the detector, and here's the labeled, the number of labeled examples. And as you can see, if you don't do any imagination, if you don't do any pre-training, uh, you, you have a smaller uh, mean AP for each a number of labeled examples. And if you do view predictive in RGP space, you get the green curve. And if you do view predictive in contrastive space, you get the red curve. So it's even better uh, objective, let's say, for your if your downstream task is this um, object detection and so on. Uh, one big problem of those representations, I mean, there are multiple problems, uh, but one problem is memory. And because um, you know now you have a 3D grid that you need to worry about. So one obvious thing you can do is instead of holding one feature vector, per grid location is to actually have one implicit function. And um, so what does this implicit function do? Well, uh, whatever we know, uh, it takes, so for every every vector here, this is mijk, so here's the vector that sits in the grid location ijk, and here's the displacement inside that voxel or nearby that voxel center, and here are the parameters of that um, function. And this function learns to map this, uh, continuous essential location to an occupancy, right? So you want to imagine the full occupancy of the scene or to what do we care about to a feature vector, right? So we call this uh, continuous or infinite resolution uh, 3D feature maps because with the help of those functions, you can query them at every location and get the corresponding feature vector. And of course, the whole point is to do better uh, than uh, interpolation, the trinilinear interpolation, right? Uh, and indeed you do much, uh, much better so you'll see here, so I have some uh, numbers that, so here is this 3D point contrast that is a, actually very strong baseline, uh, to, very hard uh, to beat, to, no imagination, just take points and say if they're close or far. And with these continuous contrastive representations, we are able to do better than the baseline and much better than using uh, voxels, right? Like fat uh, discretization of the scene. Um, Okay, and again, you do very well if you pre-train first. For example, here we use the Vodnet, the 3D Vodnet object detector. You do much better if you pre-train your representation uh, with our objectives. Uh, so you can do, of course, now you can also, you know, do exactly the same representations, not in the whole scene level, but on object level and get nice uh, 3D reconstructions of the objects as well as color renderings and so on. And you can use them again for tracking and the tracking results will be better. Uh, because these representations are just more uh, accurate, right? Because they have uh, features that sub, sub voxel uh, resolution. Now I can also discuss uh, what are the problems and what we're working on uh, right now. Uh, so how well your generative model will work will depend on how you do this um, projection and projection operation. How do you go from the image to your imagination and back uh, to the image? And whatever I have described this um, projection, the way we described it with using 3D uh, convolutions everywhere is, is very much not modular. So if you look at the features, what happens in these 3D feature maps, as the car goes on top of road, the same road feature uh, as I'm projected from different frames actually changes because it's influenced by whether the car is on top of it or not. Exactly the same thing that happens on 2D features, right? So I, so the question is, do we first unproject and try to complete the representation or do we first recognize and then complete the representation? So is unprojection and the model completion happens in a recognition agnostic way or with some weak recognition relying on those weights of that unprojection network or actually the, uh, you know, really heavy lifting is how do you go to the 2D image pixels and you have experts that actually attend directly on this and try to imagine different entities in a very compositional and, you know, modular way 
their 3D content and then project and, and so on. Uh, so this more modular encoder decoder is what we're uh, working on right now, uh, which I think, I think is way more scalable uh, way of, uh, you know, track from 2D pixels, but with latent 3D uh, bottlenecks. So this all results from tracking from the coconuts. So just to summarize, uh, what we discussed is uh, how we can build uh, 3D representations uh, for tracking for scenes by predicting views. Uh, we put this network that essentially is doing slam in its heart by going from 2D or 2.5D inputs to a 3D feature map and then rendering in another query viewpoint. Upon training, that network essentially learns to imagine you can feed it a single image and it should spit out the whole 3D feature map uh, of the full scene. And um, we show how these uh, you know, features essentially learn to follow objects over time, uh, despite the fact that we were never tracked for, for such task. Okay, so the architectures that I discussed are in these uh, published papers. Uh, yeah, the, the first fit forward, uh, you know, results for just us putting uh, together things from or from colleagues that exist out there. So I don't think it's that difficult to, to just put together and replicate. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. L let me know if you have any questions. Thanks a lot for your very interesting talk. I would like to uh, first give the audience the chance to, to um, raise any questions. Are there questions? OK, then let's let me um ask you one i was wondering about the generalization capabilities of such uh networks that like implicitly in paint to uh learn like this this um representation that we were talking about um how di diverse were the data sets that uh you were using to do to do learn this um, representation, and how well do you think does does it generalize to to um, certain objects that are like come in all, all sorts of like shapes and forms, etc. Yes, so this is a great question. So the results that I showed earlier, it showed that at least uh, you can train on few objects, and because you know the model is convolutional, you can actually put way more objects. So that was very uh, controlled experiment of uh, you know, how much you can generalize the, these view predictive networks, okay? okay. Uh, now, is this uh, all? Uh, no, uh, in fact, uh, this modular, the alternative thing that I told you, uh, the alternative architectures that we're exploring, uh, you can do um, a much, uh, much better generalization. Uh, this simple to complex, we call it simple to complex generalization. So you can train your model with on very simple components like surfaces or single objects, for example, uh, and so on. And then you can show it objects that are very entangled and occluding one another, much like that salad uh, like that I showed you. And exactly because you've trained first with simple single objects and so on, and uh, you know, essentially your network and encoders have learned the simple things by training and fine tuning in this complex scene, then you are able to uh, essentially uh, pick up the, the different individual components. Now, if you run this model the way it is on objects that are not in the scene sitting like in a clever type of world, you know, clever, this catered, clever data sets, where, you know, there is a lot of objects, but the objects are not on top of one another. They're just placed in the table, uh, much like the scenes that I showed you. I mean, this is much, much different complex than the objects are literally on top of one another and including one another and being very entangled and so on. Uh, so for this uh, extreme entanglement, I don't think that 3D convolutional architectures will be able to, to do that. Okay, thanks. Um, are there other questions from the audience or organizers? So if, if, if there are no questions from the audience, I would like to ask uh, one question. 
Um, so uh, my question is related to the family of methods on uh, view predictive uh, training that you were talking about. I find this line of work uh, very impressive. So um, I could see that uh, at the inference time, you can apply those on arbitrary sequences where you also have moving objects and even attack moving objects there uh, as, a, uh, as kind of outliers that don't uh, uh, agree with the, the prediction. I was also wondering how about during the training time? So it seems to me that during the training time, you have to explicitly assume that, um, that uh, you have a static world or, or are you may be able to, to deal with uh, potentially moving objects as outliers. So this would be my first question. And maybe the follow-up question would be, can, can you, could, do you think you could actually leverage potentially um, using sequences that are not static because in this way if you had some mechanism that uh, that learns to detect potentially moving objects as outliers you you there might be potential for emergence of uh, object detectors uh, um, to for object detectors to, to emerge so to detect uh, regions that uh, are are moving yeah so we have in fact a, a whole paper on uh... Uh, ECCV uh, track check uh, repeat uh, Adams this is Adams paper and exactly he used exactly that technique and he shows that 3D objects can actually effortlessly emerge in this way uh, just exactly by you know you having your static scene and then you see things that don't agree with your static scene and you pick them up uh, yes absolutely you can totally do that this is a method here that I propose just uh, use static scenes indeed uh, yes in general I do believe that you can totally uh, you know, assume that, you know, the object is moving, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, in general, though, I do believe that uh, if you want, let's say, to build a, a system that can recognize the objects under any pose, etc., etc., curriculum may be very important. Uh, so you can, if you want to look, build generative models, for example, to explain your scene in a way that, you know, go beyond the clever world, right, that everybody's trying now, and then we can, people don't really uh, you know, follow that direction because they think it's too simplistic. So if we want to really scale up the complexity, I think curriculum is very, very, very important, right? I mean, uh, when you try to parse a complex configuration yourself, right? You try to piece it in terms of things that you've seen before and you know how they behave in terms of little uh, sub-entities, et cetera. So yes, absolutely, that that is very, very important. But but yes, for object discovery, I didn't present it here, but I tra track check repeat Adam shows that you know, you can do way better than all these other generative models that try to do, uh, you know, reconstructions without curriculum on a lot of objects and in urban, uh, in urban scenes in Kitty. Uh, in 3D also, yeah, exactly what you suggest. Mm -hmm. That sounds that sounds very exciting. Uh, thanks for uh, for answering my question. 